of radiation-induced leukemia than we can get from radiation-induced cancer. Again, assuming that it is induced by radiation. Thyroid cancer. In the 1940s and 50s, it was common to treat children having thymic enlargement with radiation. But again, they didn't realize this was a normal process. Okay? The thymus would naturally enlarge in childhood in the response to an infection. Okay? So you can have an enlarged thymus gland. It was normal, but they didn't know that. So they were treating these kids with doses up to 500 rad, um, 500 rad to the thyroid to shrink. These kids would later present with thyroid nodules and thyroid cancer <coughs> 20 years later. Is there shrinking because of atrophy? What's that? Is that atrophy? Mm -hmm. You're absolutely correct. In 1954, children of Rongelup Atoll, Marshall Islands, of the Pacific were exposed to radiation fallout from H-bomb tests in nearby areas. They received up to 1,200 rad of exposure. Okay, They experienced the GI syndrome. That's pretty violent, right? Mm -hmm. GI syndrome is pretty violent. Thyroid cancer and an increase in miscarriages were also observed. This follows, again, the linear, non-threshold growth response relationship. Okay. On that, remember, um, for the last test, I said, for the whole body, 200 grad, you mm -hmm. got like a 1,200. Mm -hmm. 200 exposure, but this is from fallout. Wow. So this, they're probably they're really just breathing it. Okay. okay. They're probably ingesting it. Okay. But it's not going to be like a whole body type of exposure. Okay. Okay. But when you're talking about the GI syndrome, you're talking about radiation that probably got into the water and their food. Same thing that happened in Chernobyl. Mm -hmm. okay, people were dying there because the radiation fallout in the grass. Mm -hmm. okay, the cows were eating the grass, kids were drinking the milk. Mm -hmm. okay. Bone cancer. Okay, we talked about the radium uh, watch dial cleaners in the 1920s and 1930s to help out with the, the war efforts. Uh, radium salts had a luminescent uh, property. Painters would often lick the brush to make them fine-tipped. Significant amounts of radium were ingested. Now, radium is a salt, so it, it metabolized very similar to that of calcium. So, radiation got embedded into their bones. <coughs> okay. Radium has a long half-life of 1,620 wow. years. <laughs> they never get rid of that. Oh, You're yeah. not going to get rid of it, exactly. The workers received up to 50,000 rads. 50,000 rads. Radium salts were also used to treat other ailments in the 1950s. <laughs> Yeah, so this is chronic exposure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not one-time exposure, it's just chronic. Mm -hmm. Skin cancer. Skin cancer usually starts off as radiodermatitis as a result of radiotherapy. So back in the day, we're talking about the treatment of certain tumors. Okay, so if the tumor was within the body, in your three-dimensional, the x-rays have to penetrate the skin and superficial tissues. Back then, they were using very low KVs, 200 to 300, 50 to 150. Okay. So most of the energy was absorbed by the skin. There was a latent period of approximately 5 to 10 years until they started to present with the illness. Okay. And what they did determine, again, based on human observation, that as the dose increased, so did the likelihood of skin cancer. Now, remember we're talking about our, our risk estimates. One is none, okay? 
1.5, that means 50% of the population is going to experience some of these symptoms. Okay, with skin though, 500 to 200 rads is going to be 4, 4,000 to 6,000 is 14, 6,000 to 10,000 is going to be 27. Okay, breast cancer. Historically, patients were treated for tuberculosis by inducing pneumothorax. This was a thought. Treat tuberculosis, okay, by producing pneumothorax, removing the air from the lungs. Hopefully that will get rid of the tuberculin. Okay? To cause to, uh, pneumothorax, they would treat the patients with radiation. Okay? So they would induce pneumothorax by using lots of fluoroscopy. I mean, that's a lot of fluoroscopy to cause pneumothorax. Okay? Patients were treated uh, with up to several hundred fluoroscopic exposures. Such treatments later showed up as breast cancer. Some developed breast cancer from, this is another thing they did too back in the day was that um, after they had a baby, mothers would get radiation treatment because the breasts were too, too big and they wanted to reduce it back to normal size. They would get radiation treatment. Well, guess what happened? Breast cancer. Other studies were derived from post-atomic bomb survivors. Lung cancer. Historical data was derived mainly from several groups of minors. In the early 20th century, inhalation <coughs> of radon in the pitchblend mines, so uranium mine, pitchblend mines, Radon gas is a decay product of uranium. So uranium would turn into radon. Okay? In the 1950s and 60s, American uranium miners in Colorado also was breathing in this radon. Uranium has a half-life of 10 to the ninth power years of alpha and beta emissions accompanied by gamma radiation. What do we know about alpha, gamma, and beta emissions. Do Are they like x-rays? Mm -hmm. X-rays has yeah. low LET. Yeah. Alpha, from what I understand, alpha is, alpha can't even penetrate paper. Okay? So it, when it deposits on paper, all that energy is being deposited on that thin piece of paper. Now imagine that being a tissue. Okay? So in addition to high localized LET, radon settles into the lungs, <coughs> and then further decays into lead. Oh, you're, basically, you're basically a creek when you're breathing uranium. Uranium to radon to lead. Okay? Result is lung cancer. Radon exposure, exposure is now the leading cause of lung cancer surpassing <coughs> smoking. I guess they're referring to the minors. I don't think they're talking about the entire population of smokers. I think they're talking about the minors. All right. Liver cancer. In 1925-1945, thorotrast was widely used as contrast agent in angiography. Thorotrast. Thorium dioxide and its decay products emit radiation in the ratio from, okay, get this again, 100 to 10 to 1. 100 alpha particles to 10 beta particles to 1 gamma particle. We're talking about some crazy stuff here. Patients started presenting with cancer 15 to 20 years later. It is car uh, carcinogenic at the injection site, but this is what happens. Thorotrast particles are deposited in the phagocyte cells, which are normally found in abundance in the liver. Okay? So when they settle and deposit it in the phagocyte cells in the liver, they end up with liver cancer. Mm -hmm. Shall I keep going? It keeps, it keeps getting darker and darker. <laughs> All right. Total risk of malignancy. So, based on human observation on human population groups after exposure to low level radiation, a number of simplified conclusions can be derived. Number one, the overall absolute risk for the induction of malignancy is approximately eight cases for those exposed to a minimum 100 sievert 
with the at-risk period extending from 20 to 25 years after exposure. Number two, the risk of death from radiation-induced malignancy is five, five out of every 100. Simplified and an effective dose of 10 millisievert carries a risk of approximately one out of every 10,000 for malignant disease induction, half of whom will not survive. All right. When you guys do your research, have you guys started doing your research yet from the Smiths, or was that last semester? Last semester. Last semester. Have you guys ever run across the beer committee? I don't mean beer like Coors. The beer committee, B-E-I-R. The Committee on the Biological Effects of Ionizing Radiation. They have demonstrated that the stochastic effects of low dose, low LET radiation, they concluded on these three things. Okay, number one, they estimated the excess mortality from malignant disease after a one-time accidental exposure of 100 milligrays. Okay, what does that convert to in rads? 10, very good, okay. So it converts to 10 rise. It's highly unlikely in radiology, okay? Highly unlikely in radiology. They considered the response to a dose of 10 milligrays per year uh, uh, for life. Okay? It may be possible in diagnostic radiology, but it's rare. They considered excess radiation-induced cancer mortality after continuous dose of 1 milligray per year. This is possible okay? because if we are working in like fluoroscopy, this is a possible type of exposure. Okay. All right, switching gears. Radiation and pregnancy. We'll talk about the effects of radiation on pregnancy, on fertility, the fetus, the embryo, and also genetic effects. Okay, we talked about the effects of fertility, right? These are numbers that you guys are already familiar with. Both females and males, delay in suppression of menstruation, reduction in spermatozoa happens at 10 rads. You get temporary infertility, temporary <coughs> sterility at 200 rads, and permanent sterility at approximately 500. But again, these are low doses, low doses. Low dose chronic radiation does not impair, okay, I'm sorry. What I'm saying is these are not doses that we experience in radiology. These are not doses that you ex experience as a patient in radiology. I don't know why I kept saying low dose over and over again. I'm getting hungry. <laughs> okay. The radiation in utero. All observations point to the first trimester during pregnancy as being the most radiosensitive period. Why? Rapidly, rapidly dividing. Okay, because the cells are rapidly dividing. So we always say this, that if an individual, a pregnant individual, was to get a radiographic study done, we try to limit it to when? Third trimester. The third trimester. Okay, because the first and second, the embryo fetus is rapidly still developing. Now, the effects of radiation in utero are time-related and radiation dose-related. The chapter talks about these different types of effects at a minimum dose of 200, 200 rad. Okay? And depending on the stage of development, we're seeing that 200 rad will determine these different types of results. Does this, you guys have this in your chart? No. Okay. No. So again, we're talking about <laughs> an exposure of about 200 rad. Now, is this something that we, we've got live human specimens? No. Or who or what are we conducting this on? We're yeah. Dealing, yeah, we're, these are laboratory animals. Okay. And again, based on historical data, we talked about the Atoll Islands, okay, the number of miscarriages, and genetic effects based on the fallout from the H-bomb tests in nearby, uh, nearby areas. Okay. <coughs> So again, this is based on animal testing and human observation. OK, 
Okay. Two weeks of fertilization, prenatal death or spontaneous abortion may occur. Prenatal death or spontaneous abortion may occur. But also it has the same effect as uh, it's, known, it's known as the all or none effect, meaning that radiation-induced abortion will occur, or if nothing happens, okay, pregnancy is going to car be carried throughout the full term without any effects. Now, when you look at this in your book, and when you look at it on your slice, this is based on 10 rads or less. 10 rads or less. Sorry, 100 rats, 100 rat or less. Sorry, right here. 10 rat. So, 10 rat or less, nothing may happen. Anything more than that not seen in diagnostic radiography. However, it is possible, again, to get these type of exposures uh, during fluoroscopy, CT, as well as nuclear medicine. So either you're going to have a spontaneous abortion or nothing happens. <laughs> All or none. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, we're talking about major organogenesis here between 2 weeks and 12 weeks. <clears throat> now we're talking about excess excess doses of over 200, okay? You may have skeletal and organ abnormalities that may occur. The higher the dose, the greater the effect. So now with higher doses, there might be central nervous system abnormalities as well. And if radiation-induced congenital anomalies are severe enough, <coughs> this can cause not only prenatal death, but can also cause neonatal death. So again, dose dependent, and also depends on what stage of pregnancy you're in. This you guys have, right? Yes? Okay. So other studies of radiation-induced malignancies in uro also include leukemia, mental retardation, low mental development, so low IQ tests, microcephaly, impaired growth and development, I think we said this earlier, dwarfism, a few weeks back, cleft palates and also cataracts. I'm talking about the mom, who am I talking about here? I'm talking about the child, okay? So they make it full term, they survive, this is what they may um, present with later on in their life. So this, like, it happened when a pregnancy woman at the first, second trimester get exposed to radiation, right? Well, it can be, they can get a high exposure during the first, second, or third. It doesn't matter when. Okay. Yeah. But we're talking about, again, high doses of radiation. And we won't see the effects of this until, until later on. Here's the other issue that we're having, okay? The other issue why it's so very difficult to think <laughs> like this is because each case is take, taken individually. You need a large sampling of one large exposure that happens at one time to determine that these are causes of certain types of radiation doses. Okay. Again, this is based on historical data. And that's why it's very difficult to say, yeah, this is what happens when you have radiation. Well, maybe it's because there's something in the food or the water. Okay. Might be because of the power lines. Might be because I live by some by your, your our uranium coal mine. I don't know. Okay, but in, there's other stuff in the environment that may be causing this and not radiation. That's why it's so hard to, to pinpoint. Okay, genetic effects. We do not have any data that suggests that radiation-induced genetic effects occur in humans. <coughs> data comes from large-scale experiments with flies and mice. You're serious about the flies? Yeah. <laughs> I know I joke around sometimes, not all the time. Okay, 
Third generation, uh, and also this also comes from the data collected from third generation atomic bomb survivors. They also have shown no genetic effects. That's great. That's wonderful. Okay. H.G. Mueller, 1927, experimented with Dorsophilia or fruit flies. Applying exceedingly high doses, lethal mutations increased as dose increased. Radiation dose did not alter the quality of the mutation, but rather increased the frequency. Does that make sense? The type of mutation didn't change, it just increased the number of mutations. Such mutations were single hit phenomena. National Council on Radiation Protection and Measurements, the NCRP guidelines, are based on Mueller's findings. It is because of this guy that we follow the linear non-threshold. No matter how small, because he found out with flies, it didn't matter how small the dose was, the fruit flies demonstrated with some type of mutation or an effect. <coughs> okay, it's because of Muller. Russell, in 1946, and ongoing, experimented with large colonies of mice. He developed the concept of dose effect that mice have the capacity of repairing genetic damage. Okay? And so because of this guy that we get most of this guy's knowledge in performing radiation therapy. Okay? And then we talked about doubling dose a few weeks ago. Doubling dose is that radiation dose required to produce twice the frequency of genetic mutations as would have been observed without radiation. All right, was that the last slide? Yeah. All right, guys. <laughs> Test on this material next week.